Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chayla, uh, for actually uh, asking us to to have this uh, the, this launch. And also thank you very much, Sam, I think, for supporting us from the beginning. I think as you highlighted, we have worked together, I think, for the past uh, five years. And you actually encouraged us to go ahead and make come up with this as a book that can be used not only within the IFC uh, and the World Bank Group, but also a book that can actually be used as an industry uh, resource. Uh, so what uh, my colleague and I, Hubert, are going to do now is just to walk you through uh, the, reason, the things or the reasons that actually drove us into uh, writing the, the book and uh, publishing it. Okay, so I think most of you, when uh, people hear about um, index insurance, especially in Africa, one the type of the countries that come to mind for you is uh, countries like Kenya, because I think we have had a lot of development that has happened in Kenya since 2009, and you also think feel or, or hear about uh, progress that has happened in Mozambique and the countries like Zambia, but. Uh, most people don't know that actually index insurance in Africa started in Malawi. We started with uh, the Commodity Risk Management Group, and he, I was actually okay. as a local project manager. And so I worked on that from 2004 until 2009. Then I left the, the country. I was uh, transferred to South Africa. Uh, yes, after you. that, the project, which was the Meso level project, it so stopped. But one of the, in 2010, <laughs> one of the days I was at the airport, or uh, at uh, Atambo International <laughs> Airport, <laughs> I met the Eric Chapola, who is uh, the CEO of Nico, mm -hmm. and I asked him to the chief task and said, Eric, how far is the index insurance product that we started in Malawi? And he said, oh, well, since you left, uh, nothing has happened. I said, so wh why is the problem? He said, oh, okay. You know, at times the, when, you give, when you come to a place and you give people fish and you don't leave a rod, a, a, a fishing rod, and teach them to fish, what happens is when you leave, nothing's left. So the idea, the thing is you came, yes, you, trained, you helped us, but you never left anything that our people can go and refer to. So we then started thinking of, okay, yes, we can be going around, we can be doing trainings, but after we have left, what do we leave behind that people can be referring to? And then we definitely felt that what we need is, yes, local capacity building. But local capacity building can only be strong enough if we are leaving resources like books and pamphlets. Uh, some of you also know about the uh, microinsure uh, exit from the Rwanda market. Uh, again, they were there for about uh, three years. And as you can see from that picture, I think if you uh, if you can read, I think at the bottom it's not very clear. But what it's saying there is uh, uh, crop insurance uh, to suffer because the broker which was offering the product was going to be leaving. So which means all the capacity that was in the country then. It was capacity coming into the country, and then the moment the company felt that it was not profitable for them, it, they, they, they then decided to leave. But also one of the things uh, that had also happened, I think, in 2013 was Microinsure is one of the companies that had been approached by a bank. They were asked to offer a product, uh, and they offered a, a product which the client thought it was going to pay, I think, more frequently. Uh, but it was actually a catastrophic cover. So when the time came and uh, the, there was no uh, payout, the client thought, well, I, I, think, I thought I'd paid for uh, a, a dry spell, but my insurance was also, no, but that's when we offered you a catastrophic cover. So we actually felt that um, the gap in communication is because I think we don't have tools that the insurance companies or insurance brokers could actually use to do the communication. Uh, the other, so when you, we then decided to uh, write the book, one of the things we wanted was to make sure that uh, we are also giving 
uh, tools for communicating between specialists and non-specialists, which is the reason why you find that uh, part one of the book is really uh, focused on communicating with non-actuaries or non-risk analysts. But also one thing that I was excited about is uh, about two weeks ago, I don't know some of you if you have seen that uh, in uh, Zambia, I think the government has indicated that uh, for the program, the, for their subsidy program, everyone who is going to get uh, a subsidy, they have to be insured. So they are going to be contributing. Each farmer is going to pay 400 uh, kwacha, 400 kwacha, and 100 kwacha of that is actually going to be used to pay for index insurance. But then the question that comes is, if we are going to be covering a, 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 thousand, a million, I think it's a million farmers, then there's definitely need to make sure that we are offering the right product, which has been well designed, well evaluated, well priced, and we think that such tools as this will actually help us to not only come make sure that we are giving the right product, but also make sure making sure that the quality of the product is 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 of high quality. Because normally what happens at times you find that the people say index insurance does not work. But it's not index insurance that doesn't work. It's actually maybe the product that would not have been designed well or people would not have communicated the 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 difference in, in covers that they are offering. So here, what we are trying, really trying to achieve here is we are trying to make sure that uh, we, we can offer uh, a long, long-term sustain, sustainable uh, solutions, which is really passing on capacity and to pro promoting transparency and responsible insurance principles. And as I said, I think we are hoping that we are giving the fishing rods and teaching how to fish as opposed to providing the fish. I think basically that's what we hope we are achieving. As the, I, I think it was highlighted again by Taylor a few minutes ago, with her support and the support of the directors and managers, we have initiated, I think, trainings, which we started in, in Ghana. With, we have trained over, uh, over 12 regulators, 12, over 29 CEOs, and the support, I think, uh, as we will hear from Mr. Curry, the support for that um, initiative has been quite strong. Uh, and we are hoping that we'll continue to offer the trainings. Uh, so what we have today, this book is really a book that we have uh, uh, done on risk modeling. But what we know is part, two, part one of that, even though it's meant for managers, they don't have time to read it. So what we did is we went ahead and then developed even a more summarized version. And we have distributed about a thousand of these. And the demand is still, we still have a demand, more demand like uh, uh, 300 were asked for 150 from Zambia. So you can see that there's quite a demand, but there will also be need for us to continue developing more tools. Uh, I think I would ask my colleague, uh, uh, you better also just to uh, talk about their involvement in the development of the book. Thank you. Thank you, Shadrach. Um, so I was, uh, uh, I'm here to help present a little bit of the book. And, uh, um, and what I want to do actually is uh, I, I had a few slides about talking about why we were passionate and why, as a company, we wanted to help write this book. But before I, I do that, actually, um, writing a book takes quite a bit of time. Um, I think we started about three or four years ago. So first, I want to actually uh, thank Shadrach for, uh, for his you know, leadership um, and, uh, and, and taking us through you're writing a book together because uh, writing a book you don't do sort of overnight and uh, and just having someone to work with uh, like Shadrach is really really fantastic. Um, so I wanted to you know, sort of talk about the book in a little bit more general sense um, and and why we are um, we're excited about helping here um, with sort of the general objective being you know how can we improve analytics uh, to make better decisions and better decisions related to index insurance. Um, so when we, when we think about that, there are actually sort of two components on it. Uh, one is sort of how can we improve decisions? Um, another one is how can we sort of improve the analytics? Um, so if that's our goal, we actually have a number of, of challenges ahead. And so one of the challenges is a very obvious one, uh, but, but it's worthwhile sort of standing still here, is that when we're making decisions about Yep, and these are decisions that are, can be personal decisions, they can be business decisions, they can be business decisions around investing in, a, in an index insurance product, 
or developing an indicator of product, their future is uncertain. Um, and what we see in our sort of consultancy and training business is that um, very often, even though we know these future is uncertain, we tend to make decisions that are based on what we think is going to happen, or what we expect to happen, but very little effort is placed on uh, what actually might happen uh, and the risk around the future. Another, uh, uh, since we're talking here about uncertainty and we're talking about the future, uh, one of the things to, to help us with getting better analytics is try and incorporate this thing called probability in our decision making. Um, well, one of the things that, uh, that, that, that we studied quite a long time, um, and I'll quote here some other uh, people that have started working in the 1670s, uh, but that we as people and as decision makers, uh, we're just really bad at making decisions uh, where there's probability involved. Um, uh, probability um, essentially is unintuitive because it is unintuitive. Um, so let me give you an example of that. So uh, let's think about sort of a fa fairly simple um, situation where someone is tested for a, a disease. Um, in this case, we, uh, uh, we're showing here an example, for example based on that. It's Spiegelhalter. I uh, don't know if you, if you heard of him. He's also called Dr. Risk. Um, he's a very well-known uh, professor, really does a lot of work in risk communication. Um, so imagine that you have a test. Um, you go to the doctor, and uh, the test turns out positive. Um, and this test is 90% uh, accurate, which means that if, if the person has a certain disease, 90% of the time it will actually uh, become a test positive. So what's for that specific situation, what would be the probability uh, that this person actually has real the disease or breast cancer? Um, well, maybe you start thinking, well, 90% seems like a, a good, good first chance, right? And maybe you think about it a different way, but um, to actually start thinking about this, let's actually think about uh, where we would start with. If you start testing 100 people um, and you look at actually, and this is sort of called the, pro, pro, uh, the base rate or in diseases, uh, the, the prevalence, the prevalence of, of breast cancer disease is about 1% um, with a bit of rounding. So if you actually look at how these tests will actually perform on those 100 people, with one being having the disease and 99 not, um, you actually can do the math that for that one person having disease, the test will probably turn out positive. But for those 99 people that don't have the disease, you still have that 10% false, false positive in this case. So 11 will turn up positive. So if you do the math, um, and this is a fairly simple model, as you can see, um, if you do the math, actually about 8 or 9% um, uh, probability that you actually do have the disease. Um, so there are many, many different ways where you can sort of show and, and do little, little tests that probabilities really can be very unintuitive. Um, and so having models uh, that help us look at the future in sort of a probabilistic sense can really help us against so those unintuitive probabilities. Another one that, uh, that, that comes into when, when you're talking about better analytics and better decision making has a lot to do with decision making, it also has to do with analytics, but um, uh, there are lots of different potential biases we may make in our decision making. Uh, things like being overconfident, recall biases. Um, you probably have all heard of uh, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. They won the Nobel Prize on decision making and biases. Um, if you haven't, I would certainly highly recommend you, you pick up one of their books sometime. Um, uh, but these biases can really creep in when we are trying to make decisions. Um, so this book is also trying to help with you know, how we, can we use more data to inform our decision making um, and, not, and not just go for intuition and, uh, and, and biases. And then finally, um, I think a, a central premise of the book is that um, when you want to inform decision makers, you have to talk in a language that's informative. Um, that means we have tried to really go down to how can we explain sophisticated quantitative terms in, in real personal, in, in layman terms, so to speak. So, and that can be challenging, but um, so the, the way we feel that if you have a fantastic model, but you can't explain it to a decision maker, it was sort of a useless effort. So, so it's really, really important that we, we actually, in the book, spend a lot of time on um, trying to communicate really well what those, all those terms were. So thank you for, for that.
Okay, so as I was highlighting, I think for for the money, that's what we decided was, okay, we'll have part one being uh, the one that we hope the managers will have time to read through. But again, I felt that they would not really have the time to go through each and every word. So we decided to summarize and uh, put it into into this summary. But if we, uh, any of the managers, any of the technical people want to get a little bit more detail on the metrics themselves. Uh, after reading this, and if you find that you need a bit more detail, you can then go to the respective chapters that are in this book. Uh, and then for the technical people, because all we are trying to do here is we are saying, okay, a manager needs to have to look at a, a product or look at a situation and be able to make a decision in maybe five to ten minutes. So the metrics are really meant to enable them to make decisions quicker. But for them to be able to make that, someone should have done a lot of work in summarizing that. So part two is really getting to help the technical people work through every product, be it from the designing of the product, uh, evaluating it, and then once you have done that, being able then to present the summary, only the summary to the, to the manager. So you'll find that if you are a technical person and you are interested then in understanding really how is each of the matrices that have been discussed in part one been arrived you go to the, the second part of the book. Um, and finally, I would really want to, to thank, uh, first of all, our management. I think we've had strong support from the senior director, I think, on the knowledge management agenda. Uh, we are aware of that, and uh, it's, it's so uplifting when you know that you are doing something and it's being evaluated and you are, you are actually part of the goal of the organization. So I'd want to say thank you very much, uh, Chela, and I also want to thank uh, Sebastian and Alfonso, our directors, who have also been supporting us, even uh, with the trainings that we've been doing to the, in the industry. I think there's been, we've been able to do them because of the strong support that we have had. Uh, and then the managers, uh, uh, David Crash, Alejandro, and Sam, I think as I was highlighting, they started working with us from the day one, from day one of writing the book, and uh, they helped us as a team, the GIF team, Jill, um, Fatu, I think they've really contributed a lot to the process as we were writing the book. And we also had uh, some of our team members within the World Bank and others uh, outside who also contributed uh, to the technical design and then also the technical review. We would really want to thank the AIG team uh, they contributed a lot to the review of not only the models, but also the review of the, the book itself. And uh, uh, Erwin from uh, the Wharton School, uh, I think he read every word in this book and critic, and he was, uh, had a lot of um, uh, feedback on each of the, uh, the chapters that we wrote. Um, internally, we worked a lot with uh, teams like, uh, amongst them, Daniel Clegg, Julie, Diego here and uh, Alfon uh, Alfonso, they reviewed uh, the, the book and also gave their comments. Uh, it, the product would not have been what it is without your input and your feedback. So it, it is not uh, really a product that is for a product of me and Hubert and Chloe only. To me, this is a collective success for all of us. And this includes even the people, the publication team, Steve, Joel and Adam, who also really tirelessly uh, worked through with us from the beginning to the end. Last but not least, I think I wouldn't uh, do, do justice to our family uh, if I don't mention them. They really had to bear with us during the weekends and nights that Hubert and I had many calls and uh, working on that. So I would want to say thank you very much for your support and uh, Thank you, for, and we hope you will continue to support us as we continue uh, with, of course, distributing this, but also as we even develop other tools. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shadrick. As you can see, the book has gone through a very rigorous uh, review process. In fact, uh, to be honest, I had to drag it out of Shadrick because he kept saying, there's one more thing I need to do. 
Um, and this applies to even this launch, because when we started discussing names of who could come and speak about the book, again, he set the bar extremely high. And this, is a, this accounts uh, for the three very senior, very experienced individuals we have today. Uh, the first one is Bob, who is the chair of the International Curia Association General Insurance Committee. He serves as the international ambassador of the Casualty Actuarial Society, and he's on a number of numerous uh, committees, which would be uh, quite long to mention on this occasion. Uh, Raj is, from, is the director of model risk management at uh, AIG. In his capacity, he leads and conducts various activities and contributes to risk assessment, management, and governance uh, within the organization, and we're very pleased to have you here today. And then uh, we also have Mohamed Kari, who is the current Commissioner for Insurance for the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Uh, and in that role, he has continued to champion the development of, of insurance in the industry. Uh, all of them very highly qualified. And I should have introduced Hubeb, but he's become such a part of the family here that I, 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 I forget him quite often. What he didn't say about the difficulties of writing a book is that he actually did manage to do it while he was managing director of a full-time consulting firm which is consulting with several uh, companies in various fields and industries, so that's an achievement in and of itself. Uh, we suggested to our, to our guests that they would share some five minutes of thoughts uh, about the book uh, with some specific questions in mind. I mean, first of all, um, I think it would be very interesting for me to hear from Raj whether how this book on risk modeling actually helps uh, uh, an organization such as yours. Um, Shadrach has already embarrassed us managers and said we don't read these books. So it would be interesting to see whether you actually read the book. Um, this, the, the second question, and just to put them out there so that you have time to think about it, I'll put to Bob. Um, I think it's very difficult. The World Bank is in this unique, the World Bank and the IFC is in a unique position of sitting between academia, industry, government, private actors. Um, so how would you see this book fitting into all those different brackets and how it works? And then finally, with the focus and thought of our clients, if I could ask Mohammed to just think through what this means in terms of capacity building for many of our recipient countries and how he would like to see this book be used going forward. So if, we get, if you just each take about five minutes each, um, that would be useful before we open it up to the team. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> so risk management. So I, I, I have uh, spent, I would say, most of my life in risk management. And I, you know, the thing that struck me about the book, the first thing that struck me about the book was the timeliness of the book. And the reason I say that is, you know, if I go back more than 10 years, and I look back at my professors who taught me economics and agricultural economics and all that good stuff. One of the things they said is, uh, you know, we are all privileged to uh, study all these techniques. We will learn about regressions and probabilities and, you know, some kind of modeling and simultaneous equations and all that good stuff. And there's a lot of data now. And the world is progressing. So in about 10, 15 years from now, it will be a better world for everyone. Right? I loved the vision. My fellow students, we all loved the vision. That's what we want the world to be, right? But last five years, if you track, you know, things like the Gini index, the Sen index, and all these various indices, the statement is, I would say false, right? There have been these tremendous movements in the world that have changed countries, including my own country, India, right? And so where does risk management fit in? So this is the thing that struck me about the book, how timely this book is, because what we want to do now is somehow pull up the underserved and the underprivileged who are struggling. I am privileged, right? In about a couple of weeks, I'm going to visit India. I fly in a great plane, I land in a great airport, and I have all the things I need, 
right? But as I leave the streets and I, you know, take uh, a taxi or an auto or whatever you do in India, it's a very different world out there. And the thing that is startling is that the income inequality is enormously great. And I think the timeliness of the book now is that it is showing us a way to help the people struggling through insurance so that they can do their work. My grandmother used to tell me, we all come to work because we want to eat. It's true. She didn't study any economics or philosophy or anything like that, but it's true. And the farmers out there are the ones who are struggling, right? And governments have data, right? Uh, so if I take India as an example, there are very sophisticated military satellites out there, right? Can we convince the government to give us a part of that data so that we can use his probability distributions, his case studies, and take it to the government and say, look, there is a social good, there is a benefit, and if we do, if we further index insurance, you will also get elected. Right? So what Shardik was talking about is in that little, the booklet there. So this is about 300 and some 50 pages. I went through this book. It's a great book. Terrific book. Right? And I don't know, I haven't looked at that. Maybe 40 pages. Right? But at the highest levels of decision making, you may only need five pages where a decision has to be made. Now, recently India has made certain decisions. They demonetized notes. And the reason they demonetize notes is, I'm going to help the farmers. I'm going to get rid of uh, terrorism monies so that my country will be better. Right? But what we need are the tools in this book. We need the simulations. We need the probability distributions to show them whether a premise is correct. Right? It's like um, uh, Hubert mentioned probability, right? You are tossing a coin. So we, we learn in school that when you toss a coin, if you want to count the number of heads, it's, they call it a binomial distribution, right? Is that true? It's not true. There is nothing random about a coin toss. When you toss the coin, the laws of physics operate, and you know exactly whether it's going to be head or tail. The problem is the computation is so complex, we go back to probability. Right? So this risk management is a way to simplify and give proper decisions to the decision makers. And I think that's the fantastic thing about this book. And the time for this book is actually now. Because the levels of poverty, the levels of income inequality throughout the globe is very high, right? And we have to do something about it, or it will do something to us, right? So that's my, I don't know if I've finished my five minutes, but yeah. <laughs> well, I too would like to... Uh applaud the addition of this uh, this book to the literature. I think it's really a, a great addition um, uh, to uh, the literature and index insurance broadly, but particularly in the application of uh, uh, to inclusive insurance. I, um, as I, I have not read every word in the book, but I read quite a few of them, and um, I really um, appreciate it as an educational tool and as a as a uh, manual, the blend that it provides of educational material, technical guidance, um, tools, illustrations, case studies that appeal to different learning centers in my brain. Um, and in particular, uh, you know, it's easy when you're, when you're um, excited about something to talk about the positives and all the great things that it can be uh, accomplishing, but I think the authors have done a really nice job of also carefully articulating 
a variety of caveats and warnings uh, throughout the book. And um, you know, often, as, as is the case with the doctor's uh, oath, often the most important thing you can do is to not do harm. You know, that's, that's always a good place to start is uh, if you're not harming somebody, then you're uh, on a good path to helping somebody. The, um, I also uh, saw three sort of softer or uh, 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 not so specific themes that were woven through the book that, I, that really resonated with me. Uh, the first is that there are a number of key ingredients that need to be in place in order, in order for an index insurance product to be truly successful, not just financially successful, but meeting the needs of the community and the farmer and uh, all of the different uh, stakeholders. Some of those ingredients are the environment, not just the weather environment, but the cultural environment, the legal environment, et cetera. Some of them are operational, how are you running the program? Some are related to the product design and so forth, but all of them can be important. And if you haven't addressed all of the different ingredients, uh, then your chances of producing a successful program, a successful product are severely impaired. Um, the second message I took from the book is that many insurance products are not going to be successful in meeting the needs of the small farmer as well as the other stakeholder. Um, even if the products were well-intentioned, even if all the people involved really had the best intentions, if they haven't addressed all those different ingredients, as I think probably historically has frequently been the case, then the products ultimately are not going to, uh, uh, to be uh, uh, successful. And even a product that is launched on a successful basis, the world is not a, not a static place. So those products will need ongoing monitoring, ongoing adjustment, um, and particularly so if you've designed the product in, in one place and you say, well, it was, it was very successful in this country, let's move it over to the other side of the world and, and try it again, uh, it's certainly going to need some major uh, retooling to do that. Um, and as an actuary, I was excited to uh, uh, see throughout the book uh, the um, emphasis on the important role of actuaries and actuarial tools. In fact, much of the process that's described in the book is something that we in the actuarial world would call uh, the actuarial control, control cycle. You analyze some, a problem, you design a solution, you implement the solution, you monitor what's going on, collect data that tells you something about how it's performing, and then you start all over again. You analyze that information, you modify your solution, and so forth. And that's really very much the discipline that is, um, I think, very um, skillfully um, laid out in the book, uh, not in a in a uh, vague concept, but with very specific tools for uh, uh, for doing it. Um, I think the um, probably a little bit of a trick is that the the book is so well written that the um, you might almost read it and think, well, you know, even somebody who's just finished, maybe uh, you know, they're ten years old, they finished one year of mathematics, they could certainly ma master these concepts. And in fact, the concepts uh, are there's a lot of subtlety there, so there's really a I think a significant need for very skilled, very experienced, very sophisticated actuaries skilled on both the technical side, but also skilled in understanding the context in which the uh, solutions are being implemented need to be involved. This is not a problem that can be managed by um, you know, an actuary with one year of university education or not. They can be part of the team and an important part of the team, uh, but um, the um, uh, it, it, it needs some, some really uh, high-level resources, I think. Um, the emphasis on risk modeling in the book, I think, is really a, a brilliant approach to, um, to describing the problem. So, so many problems in the world, people are, you know, you get a thick report and it provides you with, here's my best estimate, and management or whoever the audience is thinks, well, smart person did it, they spent hundreds of hours, this must be, must be the right answer. Well. It's never the right answer. The world always changes a little bit. And um, risk modeling, I think, is really a, a very helpful addition to the discussion. Uh, when we've done risk modeling uh, for insurance companies, uh, in fact, I think the, some of the most important things that come out of it aren't even the analytics. Some of the most important things that come out of it is the conversation that goes into it, getting people talking about 
What are the elements that create the uncertainty? How do they fit together? Where are the correlations? You're, the journey you take in building the model, as we were talking earlier, it's, that's at least half the journey. That's uh, by the time you've had those learnings from talking to the different experts, people who are uh, experts in agriculture and experts in communications and so forth, you've you've learned a lot of um, of uh, what you need to know. Um, and probably the second most um, I've seen come out of uh, using risk modeling is it gets the conversation started about uncertainty. Suddenly, instead of giving management one answer, you're saying, well, it could be it could be in this range, but even that we're not so sure about. It might be, but it might not be. Uh, different things could happen. I doesn't understand all the bits and pieces that are. If you just get the conversation started about uncertainty and about um, the fact that the world is not going to turn out as well on our plan that we take to the investors, uh, that's that's a tremendous contribution to the dialogue that needs to occur. So I, I really thank the authors for uh, uh, stretching my brain with the uh, with this and stretching the brain of everybody who takes the time to spend time with it, and more importantly, I think stretching the communications that can occur among the community of people who want to be involved in uh, these products. Um, I start by thanking Sam for making me the last speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm glad the technical people have spoken before me. I was one of those who found the book amazing, full of formulas, uh, full of uh, terminologies I haven't heard anything about. I've always been a simple insurer all my life. I knew only indemnity and catastrophe. But the issue of uh, probability, yes, a bit of it, but uh, making prediction by probability and even making payment by probability was something I couldn't sleep with sometimes. So when we were invited, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa were invited to a two-day session, expert session, uh, or executive session rather, in Accra, Ghana. We invited um, a few players from each of the markets who have some business in aggregate to have an appreciation of what exactly Shadrach was going to talk about. A few of my colleagues uh, who are operators from my market was asking questions, trying to take time to understand the concept of the book. I advise them. I think that is why the, that is the prize for my advice that I was invited here. I advise them to relax. It's too complicated for simple things like them. But then the group also arranged a technical session for a week after the executive session for technicians of uh, the operators and the regulators from the sub-region. And uh, the young chaps understood it better than us. And I took time on my way back home and a little time when I got home to try to understand the book. Thank God I, I appreciated the first part. But the second part was definitely not for me. And when I was invited here to share our experience, I thought um, I would first commend the World Bank Group for supporting this publication and for planning to support it further. Uh, because at the Accra outing, everybody that attended wanted more. Um, the sub-region had very little exposure into this kind of agri approach, insurance approach to, to aggregate insurance. Everybody was into crop insurance, indemnity, catastrophe. Nobody had any inkling on how to do an index-based approach. A few companies ventured into, most likely from um, the reinsurance advice to get into it, because a few European reinsurers are, are supporting some operators in some of the jurisdictions. But regulators like me, we have found, um, we are caught a little unaware of the development in this area. So when we had the Accra out and we kind of uh, realized that this can be an excellent opportunity 
to push in financial inclusion, especially to the small farmers of Africa. And the few countries that have started, we have a few cases around Africa, Senegal, for example, um, Malawi, he mentioned some countries in the Southern Africa have already got into this and Eastern Africa. But the experience they have had is always to convince the farmer to buy the product. And in some markets like mine, Nigeria, like I was telling uh, uh, Shadrach before the meeting started, that uh, in Nigeria we build houses starting from the roof. Yes, I'm sure you'll be wondering. Ask, ask, ask the actuaries, I'm sure they'll explain it. Um, we, we have in Nigeria a peculiar situation where we have a demand for the products when we don't have the technicalities for the products. Um, government have attempted to promote agri and many false attempts were made earlier. But now the central bank floated a company and funded the company to finance agri. And two years into the project, they realized they need protection. And they realized insurance protection is the best. And they contacted, uh, I think, the World Bank and some experts around the world. They were advised to talk to a particular consultant who was one of the best in the world. Another consultant has approached us as regulators and the industry with their requirements for which we have no idea of. So that's building the house from the roof, if you understand the concept. Now we, are, we have been kind of tickled by what we experienced in Accra and what we have seen in the book, and now we want more because we already have a demand for this concept. We need uh, expertise at the developmental level of the products, product appraisal, and we need serious knowledge sharing with other countries that have already started the concept in parts of Africa. Um, while the few that have started have got their own experiences, they had operated as uh, silos from the other region, the whole of the region. So definitely there's need to share some knowledge, to learn from them. But most importantly, there's need to have expert consultants that will work with us on product development and also assist like Raj says, talk to government who has some data that we can develop um, from. But we need to build technical capacity, both at the regulatory part of the industry and also at the operators part of the industry. Now, the Nigerian particular example I mentioned, uh, they've decided to go ahead with some place in the market because the way season have started in Nigeria last month, and they've already um, provided financial support to farmers, but they didn't want it without insurance. And as regulators, we didn't have any idea of the products they want. But the consultant they are working with have already developed something which they believe will um, provide them an initial start. So typical of a regulator who is not very informed, we say, oh, go ahead, but we're not getting involved. But that's not good enough. So with the dry season coming up and with the support that uh, the group has offered, we wish um, we'll be supported by technical expertise to develop the data, to develop the capacity, and to be able to learn from the part of the world that have already started. Thank you. Thank you very much for those words. I've learned as a moderator never to try and summarize good content when you hear it. So I won't even try. Uh, the one thing I would like to do is to thank Jayla for joining us. I think your message on knowledge management is being heard loud and clear. I'd also like to thank Hubert and Shadrick for who have brought us here and the, the work that they've put into this. As for our three guests, I think, Raj, you've made a very passionate case for risk modeling in a world gone mad <laughs> that I, I, I fully support. I think, Bob, your, your, your optimism for the book, but with very sound words of wisdom in terms of being careful with the model. It's not as easy as the, the authors have made it sound. I think that's a very important message. And, Mohammed, 
I don't buy for a second your modesty about not being a simple insurer. You're that type of commissioner who knows how to ask the right question. So uh, thank you very much. I think you're very um, right in challenging the team uh, to continue to use this model, this uh, book, in terms of expanding its usage on the continent. So to all of you, thank you very much. Uh, in a few seconds, I'd like to invite all of you to head that side of the room, their drinks, and then turn to the right. You will find plenty of food. While we invite our guests to take a few pictures up front here with the authors. And so with that, thank you very much for joining us today.